it's been a week welcome back to bantu book review i'm so excited to talk about the second book in the binti series by Nnedi okorafor so the book is called home binti home and it was so good even better than the first so let's get right into hate it or love it picking up where we left off the last time we know that this young girl binti is traveling across the universe and the story takes us on a ride and the journey has involved a million different places at this point we have one more book to go uh but it seems to all be on the path of a singular destination this is a story about destiny purpose and it's told through the lens of science and um it's got some strong cultural roots so it's also a book about a departure from traditions and the consequences thereof and the young woman who is the protagonist in this book her name is Benty and she has an amazing gift she's trying to master her gift um and she's gotten pretty close on her own but she decides to go to a university across the galaxy like i mentioned um to hone these skills in her home in her place of origin right she's a master as far as anybody else is concerned she's been able to master her gift to a level where she's actually better equipped for duties than even her father who has the same gift but because of her gender she's not allowed to enjoy the honors or the perks of her genius and as women some of us are all too familiar most of us with the ways that people try to limit our humanity using gender as an excuse but benti pushes past all of that and i really really love it so all these expectations that people form on the basis of gender instead of her actual abilities and aptitudes she's like that's poop i'm not going to waste my time explaining anything to you i'm a hashtag just do it so she ups and leaves her home the only home that she's ever known to go across the world and she's been breaking the rules from young so this is really like not anything new for her um she's doing what she's essentially been doing uh when she travels across the galaxy and it actually turns out to be in her best interest to do the opposite of what she's told at first but long story longer she ends up having to save the world with the help of a mysterious relic i mean really she was trying to save herself and just survive but it turns out that she was everyone's hero um and she uses this relic called the idan the mystery of this relic actually is continuing to unfold in this book and i'm sure in the third book we'll learn some more about its history and and its use and its use um but yeah she's trying to hone her gift and also recover from trauma as best she can amidst all these changes. So, I already mentioned that she's going to an entirely new universe, but on top of that, she's a freshman at a university, but the only human in her class cohort. Listen, she's the only human being in her class cohort because all the other humans are dead. They gone. They dead. And honestly, the gravity of that didn't fully hit me until book 2 cuz for some reason it went over my head like maybe I'm slow obviously like humans could only come from earth and it was the one ship that was traveling from earth to her university at the time of the massacre so yeah it it fully hit me that she's the only human being in her class cohort and she was the the one survivor on the ship so anyway her bestie right get this she arrives to the university not alone because she's actually at first she was a hostage and then she became an ally of the creatures who participated in the massacre so her bestie is one of the ops matter of fact he was the main one after her neck but he's changed and the reasons he and his homies did what they did is somewhat justified for reasons that you should read about I said all of that to say that Benty is out here feeling like LeBron James in that clip that you might have seen on the internet. Let me play it real quick for you. Cuz you first time you around all white people when you came Ron, you can speak that cuz you first time you around all white people when you came to high school. Yeah, yeah. I went to an all white high school, Catholic high school. So 
like when I first went to to the ninth grade in the high school, I was on some like I'm not fucking with white people, right? Like, cause my whole I was so institutionalized growing up in the hood. It's like they don't fuck with us. They they don't want us to succeed. The hierarchy, and then we're here. Like matter of fact, we're underneath this chair. So I'm like, I'm going to this school to play ball, and that's it. I don't want nothing to do with white people. I don't believe that they want anything to do with my, I don't want no, it's me and my boys, we going to high school together and we here to hoop. So that was like my initial like thoughts and my initial shock to like white America when I was 14 years old for the first time in my life. Yeah. So this is really funny, right? That, that clip is absolutely hilarious and totally relatable, right? Binti is out here feeling like LeBron James, the king, right? Because she's, coming from a place where everybody is similar to her in the ways that she regards as the most as the most important to her identity at this point. And when I first got to college, I had a similar experience where I'm like, whoa, where did all these white people come from, right? And I actually uh, was a part of a discussion with a mixed group of people, including white people, where I mentioned this, like, yo, I'm, I don't really, I don't really mess with y'all. And they were quite shocked. But but it was the truth. Um, so yeah, she's like, look, I, I'm not really sure who you are, how you are, but y'all know why I'm here. I'm just here to learn. And, and the streets is talking. It's not all good, what's been said. Um, but yeah, she's having to adjust to her new environment with all these new expectations, but there are also new freedoms for her as well because she gets to grow the parts of herself that she most appreciates in terms of her gift and her genius and her smart, her genius and her, um, I don't, I don't quite know how to explain exactly what her gift is. Um, but she has the ability to tree and like use mathematical equations to like harmonize um so she calls herself a harmonizer in her culture and like i said it's really important that you read it to fully understand the magnitude of what it means for her to have the abilities that she has um but moving on from that in addition to adjusting to her new environment with all these new expectations and burdens and challenges she's coming into her own and learning a lot about herself and um, she's doing all this under the, the tutelage of a professor who is, is teaching her how to do what she's been doing on a different level um, and do it more effectively. But I have to acknowledge that she gives her professor a lot of credit for assisting her with the development of her treeing abilities. But I can't not mention that the professor is shook at her genius because she's never seen anything like this magical black girl. So I want to move into my favorites from the book. I love, love, love that Binti is unpacking her PTSD because that's what it is with her therapist and fully understanding and facing her fears, right? It is no small thing that she watched as all of the people around her died further. Not only did she see this happen, not only was it almost something that happened to her as well, she has to keep going, right? She's a child. She's a young girl. And this this all happened to her, right? She's a victim. But also, she's in a position where she has to mediate the tensions as a victim herself between her abusers and her new community, right? Because I mentioned her bestie is now this, this creature called Okul, right? And although they've gotten past the rift he no longer wants to kill her <laughs> it's no longer a life or death situation he was still a part of of the abuse and now she's trying to acclimate herself to this new environment but having to speak for everybody without being spoken for so that that's a lot and i really like the way that all gets addressed in the book and, and we get to see the way that that is unpacked what I also appreciate throughout this book is the importance of home and the way that that gets complicated, this idea of home, because after everything that she's gone through, Binti's a misfit, right? She doesn't really belong at home where she's from 
or in this new place, right? At home and abroad, she really is kind of out of place and she's ostracized and nothing can ever be the same after everything that she's seen and experienced at this point. So I really, I, I love the way that travel is explored and, and the consequences of exposure um, gets developed in this book. I mentioned the last time too, I love that the ship is a living organism in all the scientific ways that we get to learn about what that means. In this book, the ship, which is a fish, well, it's called Big Fish, and I think it is similar to a fish in the way that they describe it as far as like oxygen and all this, but the ship is pregnant, right? So the rooms on the ship actually shift while she gestates. So I think that's really, really cool. And um, I also really love in this book the fact that I experience personally a lot of nostalgia um, reading it and just remembering the experiences that I had that were similar to Binti's experiences. Not the same, uh, but similar in the sense of like first getting to college and, and what that looks like in a place where you don't really know. It, everything is just new. Um, also, something that was really funny to me along the same lines of nostalgia. I was cracking up when she was um, recounting her experience of not being able to go to the dance when she first came into her powers as a harmonizer. And then she, she like runs away from home, essentially, and goes to the desert. And she decided that she wasn't going to come back home, right? She ran away. She's like, I'm not, I'm not coming back. Like, they think they could tell me what to do. No, I'm going to be a new woman. I'm on my own. I'm going to live in the desert and do things the way that I want to do them. <laughs> but she didn't think any of this through. And I also did this when I was younger. It turned out differently for me. But one time, my mom was getting on my nerves. And I don't remember what happened. And you know, mama sometimes always be like, well, if you don't like it, this is my house and my rules. Do you know I had the nerve to put on my shoes like I was finna leave home? I definitely got beat for that. <laughs> but I was sick of my mom's shit. I was fed up and I was ready to go too. So I definitely had a cackle um, when she shared that story because I could definitely relate. Parents be tripping sometimes like, man, why you always think you know what's best for me? Can you just, can you listen sometimes? Dang. Young people have thoughts and emotions and feelings that are valid, even if we ain't grown. Anyways, moving on. I want to talk about some of my favorite characters. So I want to belong to a community like the Inyi Zenaria community. Um, so they're like this mysterious community of people. And because folks don't understand them, there's a lot of ignorance about what they do and and their customs and what everything means but I really want to be like Binti's desert granny right she is granny goals she doesn't label the members of her tribe she's like the leader and and she allows them to contribute whatever they are able to contribute and she appreciates their gifts whatever they may be and so their relationships are not transactional and there's not a sense of possession over their community but rather a sense of belonging. So I really love that. And it's also really beautiful to see in this book so many examples of, of women uh, being leaders and women being empowered. And Desert Granny, she is the leader of her tribe. And she, she her care and the preservation of her honor are not entrusted to a man, right? She's, so, she's self-sufficient. She understands her environment. And she's literally a student of the earth. She's a botanist. She knows her plants. She's wise. She's generous in that she helps people find the gift of self-awareness via curiosity. Um, and so she encourages you to do for yourself and to learn, right? She's like, I'm not going to tell you everything that you need to do. You're going to figure it out and you're going to you're gonna be okay. Just try, right? What I love the most too is she loves her space, right? And she don't do no arguing. She said what she said and you either going to get in or get out now. She done told you. So I love Granny. I love the way they live. Um, and, and that was just really one of the highlights of the book when Benty learns to appreciate these people by actually communing with them and being a part of their community as opposed to understanding what they're about from the perspective of people other than them. Because it gets tainted. Like, what I tell you about myself is going to be totally different from what you hear about me. And maybe there might be some things that, that align and some things that overlap, but 
there's nothing like knowing for yourself. So that that was amazing. Um, not so phased. Let's move on to the bull, to the bull jai. So there are some complications with Oku. In the first book, I'm like, oh man, I love you. Well, I don't love you. It's complicated. It's, it's less than love. But it, there's a sense of like affection. Like I, I like Oku a lot. I appreciate him. But now it's not all love, right? You still gotta, I've, I've, we, we have to, it's a, it's a complicated love hate thing with Oku in the sense that like, we're always aware of the way that Oku and his presence triggers Venti, right? She at this point has accepted that she's going to interact with him. She's accepting him as her brother in a sense. Um, and she can appreciate the things that he brings to the table and the things that she's learned from him. Still, though, he's affiliated with the ops who literally killed people that she was coming to know and love. And, and he actually participated in this. Um, and like I said, there, there are reasons that he did what he did. And in a lot of ways, he is justified. Um, and I do identify with some of the reasons. That said, right, he's problematic um, because Benty's fighting through flashbacks and pain, but at times he can be really callous and apathetic in those emotional moments for her. And then freaking Oku want to be an agitator, right? He's like always being a hothead and like, listen, you want war? I'm going to give you war. Like he's always ready to fight. He's always on go, right? And it, it just frustrates me throughout the book at several moments when he's so oblivious to the pain of a person who has helped him, right? When he had that little shriveled up tentacle and she rubbed her ojitsu on it to help him, right? She was there for him. And, and I think that there are a lot of ways where he fails to be there for her. And it's, it's annoying. So he's trying to stir up intergalactic mess and drama at different points. And it's like, what is your problem? Calm down. And then the other annoying thing is, so when, when Benti allows him to use her ojitsu, he goes, it's not good to be this pleased with life. It's not good to be this pleased with life. Like he wants to be angry. Really? Do you know somebody like that? I do. They insist on being angry, Annie. And it's like, why? Get over yourself. Smile. Damn. So I really wanted to ship Oku back to wherever the hell he came from at various points because he was getting on my damn nerves. And I mentioned the last time that Oku doesn't have a gender, but I believe that he is a male, right? And in this book, this second book, adds another layer of identity for him. In my opinion, I feel like not only is he just a like a guy, he's a man. I think he's a black guy. As a matter of fact, that LeBron clip that I played probably applies more to him than Benty because she's very polite and she diplomatically handles a lot of bullshit that Oku would not go for. Um, but yeah, he's like super aggressive and, and several times throughout the book, Oku wants all the smoke and it's like, chill. You know, he basks in being like massive and intimidating and problematic and he wants to fight and we do understand his fury because of the way that people treat him and the way that people respond to him. He, the defense mechanisms that he has, they're not for no reason, right? People are automatically attacking him or making certain assumptions about him without any provocation. And then they move on like nothing happened when they realize he's not actually the threat that they assumed he was, right? And in a couple different places in the book, um, they endanger his life and everyone else's life and then move right along afterward like nothing happened. So I get it and I don't, right? Um, I mostly get it. I do. He just, he makes me upset because of the way that, that he engages with Benty when I feel like she needs him to be a friend and um, he can be very self-absorbed. But then, you know, you can, I can kind of relate to the complex of being self-absorbed when like you have to be watching your back and keep your head on a swivel all the time. And it's like being responsible for myself is a lot of work. So it's hard for me to also have you in my care as well. So I can, I can get that. I think it's funny too, that, um, his preference is to have the menacing presence that also becomes a problem for him. Um, because, you know, he's like, listen, be afraid of me. I want you to know that I'm threatening. And I want you to know that I will respond to you in the way that you 
you come at me. Um, so yeah, love and hate still continues with Oku. And actually in this book, our boy goes missing by the end. So we have to go rescue him. I don't know what's happened. Binti brings him home to literally her hometown. And oh my gosh, I don't even, I don't even want to get carried away with all the reasons why that may have not been the best of ideas considering everything that has happened so far but moving on to pigs right when Bensi first arrives home like i said there was an attack <laughs> there was a treaty that the kuish people who are equi who are equivalent to white people in this book they attack Binti and Oku, well, really Oku, and endanger everybody else's life in the process. And in doing so, they violate the intergalactic treaty for peace, right? And they attack these people, put everybody's lives on the line because they are afraid and just being overzealous with the action. Like, nobody asked for this. He didn't do anything to you. Mind your business, right? They attack him, they attack everyone. Benty mediates once again, coming to the rescue, saving everybody. They move on like nothing happened. And it's like, uh, hello, y'all not even going to acknowledge it. And it's like, no, just like in, in real life, it parallels to a lot of what happens in society where like people are aggressive toward you and then they become the victim, right? Like, oh my gosh, oh, I had to, I had, to, I feared it. No, stop. Anyway, what peeved me getting to the point that I was trying to make, there's an interview, right? Benty's a hero. She saves the world. She she does all these things. And in the midst of this crisis, they're talking about mating. Like, oh, how do you feel about the fact that, like, after all of this, maybe you won't find a husband and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, man, don't nobody care about a husband or mating? I just nearly died. I don't care. And furthermore, I was attacked by you. And then you moved on like everything was all good. And the failure to acknowledge people's failure, whether it's the Kuish, white people, whoever, like anyone, when you fail to acknowledge your own behavior as problematic and the very reason that things have gone awry, it's, it's an issue. And it really makes me think like, hmm, should I attribute a lot of, of the strife throughout history to your actions as well? Yeah. Yeah, I should because everybody else is chilling, right? And you're just on edge and you are so keen to like defend yourself that you're putting everybody else's life at risk because you're afraid instead of trying to kill everybody, kill, kill yourself. Okay. Because you, you're just, you're, you're the dangerous one, not everybody else who you feel like you're protecting yourself from and defending yourself against. You have not actually been attacked or provoked in any way. So handle yourself instead of worrying about me. That was annoying. The other thing that peed me, so Benty did the right thing. I really do think that she was brave in making the choice that she made. The way that she did it, I've I've come to understand too that like you don't always have to explain why you're doing the things that you're doing if they are the right thing for you to do. So we just have to agree to disagree on that, right? Still. I really feel like she deserves an ass whooping for spitting on her sister because you cannot abuse people even when you're right. She spit on her sister who didn't agree with the choices that she made. I get it. Her ability to accept the choices that you made and the means by which you made those choices is not really your business. However, you still need to have respect and you still need to have some decency about yourself and you probably should have gotten beat up for that. That was annoying. And I'm going to move on lest I get further further down this the, down this desert hair's burrow <laughs> um, in the book. That was a really cute phrase that the, that the uh, author used instead of rabbit's hole, uh, which was contextually specific and just really colorful um, language that I loved. Um, but I'm going to move on. Like I said, I will say finally that book two was even better than the first, like I mentioned. Um, and I had to revisit my rating of the first one because in hindsight, the first book is much better than I realized when I consider it now as a part of the collective body of work by Nnedi Okorafor. So 
it was really good. Again, highly recommended. Read it, read it, read it. This week in emotional intelligence, right? Benty's feelings throughout this book are articulated really, really well. And throughout, I really identify with a lot of the things that she feels. And I very much look forward to the next one. But throughout this book, I was feeling anxious, confused, concerned. This is also how I felt more recently about a lot of the things that are happening in the world, a lot of the things that are happening around us. Um, mostly confused, mostly concerned, because like people are are bugging out. Like people are really confused and making other people, making the rest of us responsible for their confusion and for their misguidance. And it's like, get yourself together, right? Handle your own emotions and, and stop making me carry your load. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's very annoying. Um, but I, I just am appreciating the folks that have, that have been brave and I'm encouraging the folks who are not the folks who are delusional to also be brave and stand up for yourself and the things that you believe in when they're reasonable, like when they're right. You know what I mean? Some people like you, you believe in things that are hateful right? You're engaging in hateful behaviors and saying hateful things and thinking that you're standing up for yourself. That's not what you're doing. Putting somebody down is not standing up for yourself, right? If, if your sense of self-worth and your sense of self is threatened when other people stand up for themselves, you really need to work on yourself and stop making other people responsible for the things that you need to be responsible for right? Stop showing the world that you're an idiot and learn, do better and be better. And instead of manufacturing more problems, you need to be a part of a solution somewhere and shut the hell up. It's very annoying. Like do, do the work on yourself. Nobody's responsible for you. Right. And, and I also want to say that like, if you are hateful, if you're racist, if you're stupid, if you're dumb, like if somebody has told you that about yourself, examine yourself it might be true right but no the truth can change within moments you can redeem yourself and what you believe to be true can change at any moment you it's not enough to get mad when people call you a name that's true racist stupid or otherwise you can be active and change your status right there are things that you can do to not be an idiot there are things that you can do to not be a racist so do those things and you'll be in the clear If you're mad that people are calling you what you are, you're mad that people are telling the truth, you're delusional and and you really need to work on that. So yeah, that, that, that's, that's how I'm feeling this week. Um, and I'm, I'm, it's just, it's very confusing that people don't know, like logic. I, I don't know. It's certain things. It's like, man, we call certain things common sense and it's like, it's not common. Apparently a lot of people, many people don't understand the things that we believe to be common sense. Ugh. Learn though. Learn. Like don't stop at ignorance. Don't stop at like, oh, this person called me. Don't, don't. Th- this pity party, it has to end. Like get over yourself. Worry about yourself. And and I'm going to move on. Um, But I also want to shout out, right? The folks, as always, who are doing the work, they have responded to the call of action. There are so many people. There are so many organizations, and I'm going to shout them out. Brown Liquor Report is still where I'm getting all my news. CategorizedTweets.com. Shout out to Own Greenleaf. Hey, man. That's my show. It's back. Shout out to Nike, right? Um, And the Just Do It campaign. Shout out to anybody who's who's living their truth, man. Um, Shout out shout out also final words for this book um because it just is so good and I, like i said i can't wait to see the last one shout out to this beautiful brown teenage girl she saved the world and black women are always saving everybody right it's no surprise why are you mad when you should be grateful for brown women and men and children and, and, and the people who save your asses every time. Be grateful for Serena. Be grateful for Nadine. Be grateful for Benti. Stop being entitled and bratty and pay homage. Give thanks. Don't 
don't remake your true idols in your likeness. Your idol is a black woman. Appreciate her for who she is, not who you want her to be, right? There was a part of the book. These little coolish kids were like, ooh, I heard about you, but I didn't know you were so soily. And it's like, <sighs> annoying. Be grateful. Now you know, right? Now you see exactly who I am, right? And it's like, oh, your discomfort for with, with my appearance or with something that you don't understand because you don't share this part of your culture or your, this is different, right? I get it. You don't, you don't understand. You're ignorant, but don't make me responsible again for your ignorance. And don't, don't remake your icon, your heroes, your trailblazers in your likeness, right? The, the Queen Nefertiti who, who looks white. Betty Boop is white. The, the wax figure of Beyonce at Madame Tussauds was also some BS before they adjusted it. Gerard Butler as an Egyptian god. Imagine. And I love him. But it's like, stop, stop doing that. Stop changing the things that are true, right? Stop, stop altering facts. Do you know and care about history? Are you delusional? Yes, you are delusional. But, but just fix yourself. So many people, oh, I'm really, I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop right here because I'm going to get carried away. But I just, it's very annoying, right? Many, many times people complain about being limited and being stifled. And, and then they try to control other people who are brave enough to claim their own freedom. And it's like, you actually love the rules, right? You, you, you love the box because you constantly try to put people who don't fit into the box back in the box when they get out. Of, of what the norms are for you and your little world and try to make them fit. Uh, you, you love those limitations because you can settle in and get comfortable with blaming everybody but yourself for your failures. And, and I had to question, like, is, is this me? Do I also get comfortable with, with being limited in certain ways? And, and the answer is yes, I think we all do. Um, but I'd rather not complain about the rules and trust myself. So I've really been working on, on doing, doing things that I need to do and doing things that I have to do um, for me, right? And not abiding all these rules from the system. It's, it's time that I figure it out for myself, and I'm, I'm definitely doing that. It's time that we all figure it out for ourselves because we know that the system is rigged. We know they're lying to us, abusing us, stacking the deck against us. So why should we play by our rules? Why? What would be the purpose by, of playing by the rules for, for a person who doesn't have your best interest at heart. And the answer is that we shouldn't. So I'll see y'all next week. Check me out on social media at Bantu Book Review. I'll be reviewing the next Binti book. It's the last one, number three, The Night Masquerade. Thanks for listening.